Here in the words of this psalm, the psalmist declares that one of the difficulties and one of the weaknesses of God's people is how forgetful they were. They forgot what God had done for them. They forgot the mercy that had been shown to them. They ignored the wonders of His hand. Well, this morning we're going to read uh, Psalm 103. We'll read Psalm 103. We're going to read the whole of this psalm. It is a beautiful and a majestic hymn of praise to the Lord. But our attention this morning will be focused on just one verse. We're going to focus our attention on verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. That will be our text. We'll read the whole psalm, but that will be our text for this morning. And we want to zero in on this issue of the forgetfulness and the fearfulness of God's people. And we want to see how Christ has given us victory over these things. Psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He makes known His ways to Moses his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children to those who keep His covenant and remember to do His commandments. The Lord has established His throne in the heavens and His kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you His angels, you mighty ones who do His word, obeying the voice of His will. Bless the Lord, all His hosts, His ministers who do His will. Bless the Lord, all His works in all places of His dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands firm and sure forevermore. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? It sounds like this ought to be such an extraordinarily straightforward thing to do. Because surely the children of God, mindful of everything that He has accomplished for them, mindful of how He has labored to secure their salvation and their safety, surely the children of God ought to be moved to praise Him for His fatherly goodness and for His fatherly care. And yet, historically speaking, That certainly hasn't proven to be the case. In fact, any honest assessment of the historical record would show that God's people have proven to be a shockingly forgetful bunch. Forgetfulness, for instance, has become or became a a patterned way of behavior for God's people in the Old Testament. Consider, for instance, how God's people behaved when they first entered the wilderness. They had just passed through the waters of the Red Sea, waters that had been split open for them by the power of God. They had literally just been led through those waters on dry ground. They had turned around and watched as those waters had come crashing back down on Pharaoh and all his hosts. And almost immediately after they've entered into the desert wastes, what is it that they begin to do? Well, they begin to complain. They begin to complain about how they've been led into the desert and how they've been brought there to be abandoned, to be cast aside by God. They begin to mutter about how it is that they're going to starve to death in this wasteland. 
Or what could we say about the behavior of God's people when they were gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai? Remember the events that occurred there as the Lord gathered them in order to give them His law, in order to lay before them all the stipulations of the way that He would be served? The Lord descends in power. He descends in glory on that mountaintop. His glory is so great and inescapable that He needs to surround that mountaintop with thick clouds of darkness. But from the midst of those clouds of darkness, the people hear the very voice of God itself. He speaks to His people. They see His glory, they hear His voice, they experience His power, the thunder, the lightning, the ground shakes. And yet what is it that happens when Moses ascends the mountain and he doesn't return as quickly as the people think that he ought to? What is their conclusion? Well, their conclusion is to say, we've been abandoned. That's it. God doesn't love us anymore. Time to find some new gods. Time to find some new gods who will actually take care of us. What could we say about the miracle of the manna? God literally sends his people the bread of angels. He literally coats the ground with a, a sweet bread that they can go out and pick up every day. He provides for them in the midst of this wasteland. And yet, how is it that so many of God's people responded to that provision? When God comes to them and he says to them, don't gather any more bread than you need for today, so many of the Israelites said, I don't know about that plan. I think we'll gather twice as much. I think we'll go out and we'll get twice as much as we think we need because at the end of the day, yeah, God, he took care of us today, but we're not entirely sure that he's going to be there tomorrow. And this pattern of forgetfulness this pattern of failing to realize that the God who had taken care of them yesterday would continue to take care of them today and would continue to take care of them tomorrow, that pattern of forgetfulness, it becomes normative for God's people throughout the remainder of Old Testament history. Again and again, when God's people were faced with challenges, when they were faced with the threat of foes, when people pressed down upon them, whether it was the Philistines, or whether it was the Babylonians, or whether it was the Assyrians, when they faced those threats, how did they respond? By relying on horses, by relying on weapons, by relying on foreign allies. You can think of the wicked king Hoshea. When the Assyrians come and, and they begin to press down upon the people of Judah, how did the Israelites respond? How did Hoshea lead them? Not into faithfulness, not into repentance, but into an alliance with Egypt of all people. They turned back to their oppressors in the day of trouble. They went back again and again to the land of Egypt over the course of their time. And this remains constant right up throughout the whole of their history, even in exile. Do you remember what we learned about Mordecai? When Mordecai comes to Esther and he, he comes before her and he says, you need to go and you need to stand before Xerxes' throne and you need to plead our cause. And understand, says Mordecai, that if you don't do this, what will happen? Mordecai says salvation will come from somewhere. He doesn't say salvation will come from the hand of the Lord who has rescued us time and time again from our enemies. No, Mordecai stands there and he says, look, Esther, if you don't do this, I'm sure we'll be saved. I don't know how or by whom, but salvation will come from somewhere. And you want to say to Mordecai, haven't you opened a history book, Mordecai? Don't you know the mighty deeds that God has done? Have you forgotten the Lord? Have you forgotten all his benefits? How could you have set aside your understanding and your remembrance of the salvation and the security that God has given his people for generations? And the reality is this pattern of forgetfulness that's established in the old covenant, it continues on into the new covenant, doesn't it? Here we can think of the examples of the disciples. Christ's 12 apostles who he calls to himself, who are closest to him, who walk with him day by day, who hear his teaching, who see his mighty works firsthand, who are receiving the word of the Lord from the lips of Jesus Christ himself. And yet what a forgetful bunch of people they prove to be. Mark 6 is such a fascinating chapter in this regard. Perhaps this afternoon at lunch you might read through that chapter as part of your afternoon devotions. There are two remarkable accounts that are set one right after the other. The chapter opens with Jesus feeding the 5,000. 5,000 men, women, and children have come out into the countryside to hear Jesus preach. And Jesus realizes that there isn't enough food for all of them and that they're going to be hungry and that they'll need strength to return home. And so he says to the apostles, what are we going to do about this? 
And the apostles say, I don't know. Uh, what do you expect us to do? How are we possibly going to feed these people? And Jesus says, well, look around and see what you've got. And they come back to him with the loaves and the fishes. And they hold the loaves and the fishes out and they say, well, this, this is all that we have, but this is barely enough for a few people. And Jesus says, give me the loaves and the fishes. And he prays over them and he blesses them and he breaks them and he gives them to the people and he breaks and he breaks and he breaks and he continues to break. And what happens at the end of that story? At the end of that story, Jesus calls the disciples to himself and he says, go out there and pick up the leftovers. And so much has been made of this question about why Jesus sends them out to do this and why they come back with 12 baskets and what's the significance of that number. I think at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, it's really very simple. Jesus wanted them to go out there and he wanted them to physically collect the leftovers so that if they picked up more bread and as they picked up more fish, that lesson of his provision would be driven home for them. As they picked up all those leftovers, they could do nothing except for say to themselves, he not only provided enough, he provided super abundantly. His provision was more than we needed. And so Jesus sends them out to collect those leftovers to drive home the point that he is an almighty, that he is a sufficient savior for his people, that he never abandons them and he always gives them more than what they have needed. And yet what happens in the very next part of the chapter Mark transitions from the story of the feeding of the 5,000 with the word immediately. It's one of Mark's favorite words, and he says immediately, Jesus, after having them collect those leftovers, he puts them in a boat and he sends them out on the sea. Why does he do this? Because he knows, as Mark tells us, that when they get out on the sea, that they're going to have trouble rowing, and that they're going to get caught in the winds and the waves. And Mark tells us that as the winds and the waves roared, that the the apostles were straining, straining against the oars. Jesus sees them from the land. What does he do? He walks out on the water to them. What's the reaction of the disciples when Jesus walks out on the water? They see him coming and they decide that he's a ghost. They've literally just experienced the superabundant provision of God. He is literally just set before them only hours before a testimony that they could touch and taste and see of His goodness, of His graciousness. And a few hours later, they're out on the lake and they despair for their life and they despair for His. They see Him coming and they think He's a ghost. And if He's a ghost, that means He must have died. And if He's died, that means He must have abandoned them. They pick up the 12 baskets and then they forget immediately who he is and what he's done. And the reality is what was true of the disciples also proves true of the early Christian communities. What was true of the disciples as a small group proves true of the the churches as a whole. We've been studying the book of 1 Timothy. What was it that caused Paul to have to write that letter? It was the fact that the Ephesian believers had forgotten the gospel that they'd been taught. They'd forgotten the truths of the gospel that that Paul had so earnestly laid before them. They'd looked at those things and they'd gone, yeah, that seems good. But let's go back to the Old Testament here and see if maybe we can find in these Old Testament genealogies a different source of righteousness, something of our own wisdom that we can lay hold of. So how often doesn't Paul have to write to the churches and say, I'm writing the same thing to you again because you've forgotten the Lord's goodness, you've forgotten his provision, you've forgotten what he's done for you in Jesus Christ. Peter has to do the same thing in his letters. I don't tire of reminding you, Paul says. Peter says, I'm writing again because his people had forgotten. And the truth is, brothers and sisters, if we're honest and we make an honest assessment of our own lives, We'd be forced to confess to the truth that we are just as forgetful as God's Old Testament people. We're just as forgetful as the New Testament people. How often isn't it the case in our lives that we forget today how the Lord has cared for us yesterday, how he has cared for us in the past? How quickly don't our memories of the Lord's goodness to us How quickly don't our memories of his benefits and his blessings, how quickly don't they fade? 
And the reality is, brothers and sisters, we need to acknowledge that our forgetfulness is not just a regrettable state of affairs. Our regretfulness is a dangerous state of affairs. And that is because when God's people get forgetful, their, their forgetfulness has consequences. Think about the way that things worked out for God's people in the Old Testament. What happened when they became forgetful about what God had done for them? Well, they were restrained from praising Him. They certainly weren't in a position to bless Him, were they? And in fact, not only was their ability to praise and bless Him hindered, the truth is that they began to grumble. They grumble, says the Old Testament. They grumble against Moses. They grumble against God. They begin to speak bitterly about who God is and how He's cared for them. But grumbling isn't actually the worst of the sins that forgetfulness can lead to. Once again, think of the Ephesian believers that we've been considering in Paul's letter to 1 Timothy. What did forgetfulness cause them to do? As they began to look in the Scriptures and as they began to pursue their own wisdom, as they began to spin fanciful speculations about how it is that they had a relationship with God, Paul says to them, you've given up the mystery of the faith. You've given up your hope, your forgetfulness of who God is, and your forgetfulness of what He's done for you has caused you to wander from the truth, to return back to bondage and slavery, and to give up the hope that you had. And it's extraordinary. Jesus Himself speaks of this in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 2, the letter to the Ephesian church. What does Jesus say? He says, I praise you for this. You've learned to consider the teachings of those who claim to be apostles but are not. So well, that's comforting, right? We realize that the Ephesian believers must have benefited from Timothy's ministry. They must have heeded Paul's call through these letters. And yet Christ goes on in that letter and he says this, but yet I have this against you. You have lost your first love. You've forgotten You've forgotten the passion and the commitment and the zeal that you had when you first heard the gospel. And when you turned to me and you committed your lives to me, you have forgotten your first love. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to recognize that forgetfulness of the Lord and of his benefits, it doesn't just hinder our praise of him. It makes us grumble against him, and it can actually cause us to abandon him altogether as our zeal as our commitment, as our love for Him grow cold. And so the question then becomes this morning, well, look, what, what is the source of our forgetfulness? Where does our forgetfulness come from? Why is it that so consistently God's people prove to be forgetful? Why can't we remember what stands in the way of doing what we're told to do here in verse 2 that just seems so simple? Well, the answer, I believe, is that our forgetfulness is most often so the source of our forgetfulness is most often our fear. We become afraid. We become afraid. And what, what causes us to become afraid is that we look at the circumstances of our lives. We look at the circumstances of the world around us. Consider how the Israelites behaved. They cross through the Red Sea and they're standing on the other side and Pharaoh's hosts have been drowned behind them. You'd think they'd look back and say, whew, that was amazing. The God who did that certainly isn't going to let go of us. But that's not how they behave. They look forward and they look at the desert. They look at the harsh wilderness conditions. They look at the lack of food. They look at the lack of water. And their fearfulness about surviving in that harsh environment causes them to forget. Exactly the same thing happens to them when they come to the borders of the promised land. After 40 years of wilderness wandering, they arrive at the borders of Canaan and they send in the spies. And what is the report of those spies when they come back? To a man, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, the spies say the people in that country are great. They're powerful. They're mighty. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. We don't stand a chance against those people. After 40 years of wandering in the desert, during which the entire time God says your sandals didn't wear out, you didn't go hungry, you didn't go thirsty, you didn't lack for anything, I gave you victory over all of the people who attacked you in the desert, they get to the borders of the promised land, and that very desert which has caused them to tremble in fear, 40 years ago they say, yeah, I think we should go back there. 
I think we should turn around and head back into that desert that once so terrified us because those people in the land of promise, they're too great for us and they're too mighty. Think about the apostles. What was their trouble? They get in this boat. They have just had this testimony of God's power in their life, but they look at the storm. They look at the wind. They look at the waves, and it is their consciousness of their circumstances that drives away their memory of God's faithfulness. Peter has that same problem. Jesus calls to Peter and says, get out of the boat and come to me. And Peter is doing great as long as he keeps his eyes on Jesus. But we're told in Scripture that when he looked at the waves and he looked at the thrashing waters and when he considered the wind that was blowing, when he took his eyes off the Lord and he looked at his circumstances, he grew afraid and he forgot. He forgot who he was walking to. He forgot who it was that had called him. Brothers and sisters, the reality is this. We are, we are the same. We are the same as the Israelites in the desert. We are the same as the apostles in the boat. We are the same as Peter walking on the water. We know that God has taken care of us. We know that he has led us through every step of our lives. There have been moments where we have seen that so clearly. And yet, There are times when we are faced with our circumstances that we look out and our hearts get afraid. Think of our world today. It's election season. Okay, right? It's going to be long. There are going to be signs. There are going to be people. There are going to be promises. There are going to be... We worry, don't we? We think, who's going to win this election? Who's going to win here? What what does that mean for our, our place here in society as Christians? We worry. We look at gas prices, we look at home prices, then we look at wages, and we get afraid. I've seen that in the young people today, young people that have come to me and said, I don't know how we're supposed to do this. How am I supposed to get married? How am I supposed to have a family? How am I supposed to establish myself in a world where I can't ever hope to make enough money to survive? How am I going to pay school fees? How am I going to do this? And yet we look at our parents and we look at ourselves and what do we realize when we look? The Lord has taken care of us. Here we sit in our building. There's Guido and there's Timothy and there's Bellstone and the teacher's college and the seminary. It's all there. We look at all those buildings. We stand in those buildings. We go to those buildings every day. And yet when we're confronted with the rising cost of life, we say, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it? We look at COVID too, don't we? We're getting a respite right now, but we worry. We look ahead after the election. We look ahead to September and October. We think, what are we going to do? How are we going to get through it if the mandates come back? What are we going to do? How are we going to survive? We forget the last two years. The last two years where the Lord kept us together through, through thick and thin and through all of it. He kept us bound together as a church family, and yet we can't help looking at September and October and being afraid, worrying. So the question becomes then, brothers and sisters, what would happen if we weren't afraid? What would happen if the fears that we have could be calmed? What if those fears about how we will make our way through this world, what if they were taken away from us? Do we understand, brothers and sisters, that that is precisely what is happening this morning? That is precisely what is happening this morning as we come to this table. The Lord Jesus Christ, who is King of heaven and earth, our risen Savior, He calls us as His King, as our King, to come to this table, and He does so that He might put our fears and our worries to death. He says, you this morning will come here, and you will sit with me at this table, And I will remind you of who I am. I will remind you of what I have done for you. And I will remind you of the victory that I've granted you. You know, the extraordinary thing about us is that we forget. We forget who God is. But the wonderful thing that we're told here in Psalm 103 is that while we are so easily forgetful, God doesn't forget. He never forgets who we are. The psalmist says here, David says in verse 14, for he knows our frame. He remembers. 
And what is it that he remembers? He remembers that we're dust. He remembers how forgetful we are. He remembers how weak we are. He remembers how prone to doubt we are. What the Lord Jesus Christ remembers about us is that when we're confronted with the winds and waves of life, we strain with all our might against the oars to row across the ocean, but we have this tendency to think that he's a ghost. He remembers our weakness. And why does he remember our weakness? Because he bore our weakness. Because he clothed himself with our frail, limited, doubtful human flesh. He remembers what it's like to be one of us. And he remembers what it's like to be one of us because he still is one of us. He took our flesh up into heaven to be with him there. Our humanity sits at the right hand of God in heaven. And this morning he says, come, sit with me. I've given you this sacrament because I remember how weak you are and I remember how prone you are to fear. And so I call you this morning to come and sit at my table. And we're going to take some bread and we're going to break it. And when you see that bread broken, you will remember that my body was broken. Broken for you in the complete forgiveness of all your sins when it was nailed to the cross of Golgotha. And we're going to take a cup and we're going to put some wine in it and you're going to drink that wine and you're going to remember. You're going to remember that my blood was poured out for you in the complete forgiveness of all your sins. My blood was shed on that cross of Calvary that you might be washed clean of all your sins. But it's really more than that, isn't it? We don't just come to this table to remember. It's not just a memorial meal. It's not just where we think back on what Christ has done. And why is it more than a memorial meal? Well, it's more than a memorial meal because the wonder of this table is that here Christ is with us. I'll be with you this morning, he says. I'll be with you at that table. And I'll be with you because my Holy Spirit, who dwells within your hearts, will lift you up and exalt you and bring you into my heavenly throne room, where I am already seated and waiting for you. And together in that heavenly glory, we will remember and rejoice, and we will praise God for all his benefits. And you'll be reminded of the fact that I have been victorious. I've been victorious over your sin. I've been victorious over... All of your and my foes, I sit in heavenly glory where I am lifting you up to to be with me this morning. And you will know that this is where you are headed. This is where I am leading you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Amen.